Okay. Have the slides, please. Okay. Good morning. Um, quick thanks to INET and CG for the invitation to speak about this. I'm the director of the School of Economics and Business of the University of Chile. I want to stress this because what I'm going to talk about is a case of curricular reform in economics, but in an economics and business school. And uh, just a little quick thing, if we're serious about reforming how economics is, is thought, we have to think about business schools, okay? This, just That's the majority of the, the market, by the way. So uh, that's a very important thing we have to bear in mind. Um, so I'm going to um, give you a little bit of the plot for the reform. First thing, anybody who's been around economics for a while knows that Chile is a emblematic, is perceived to be an emblematic case of very conservative economic policy application for a long time. It's not really that uh, as it looks, but, it, but it, that's the way it's perceived, and it's perceived internally as well, in that way. So uh, it's sort of the uh, poster boy for neoliberal economics for a long time. Uh, second thing, the school I, 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 I'm in charge of is an, a really important school. It uh, forms a significant amount of the leaders both business and political leaders of our, of our country. So it's a, it's a very relevant place politically. Uh, third, of course, we had the subprime mortgage crisis, which detonated uh, a crisis in economics and finance. Um, uh, fourth, we had the international wave of protests in 2011. And all this added up to, um, um, a, um, uh, together with a big crisis we have in the, the uh, public education system and in the university system in Chile, which I'm not going to get into, but a big crisis. And all this added into a, a very, very, very explosive situation uh, in 2011. Just to give you an idea, this is the campus where we are. Uh, it's one of the campuses that the University of Chile has. And during 2011, almost every two or three weeks, we had protests at these uh, three points. Uh, so in the middle, you'll see that there's a red thing there, and that's, the, that's where the faculty is, uh, writing papers, okay? And so we would have meetings with some of our colleagues and talk about, let's say, a paper on Mincer equations or something like this, right? And, and the returns to education, and we would look down from the 16th floor, and we would have battles going on uh, at, at these three points every two or three weeks. The union leadership, the student union leadership that run the whole protest uh, in Chile, which were enormous, uh, at one point, we had half a million people in the streets, okay, uh, uh, is just, is within the campus. It's 100 meters away from my office. So this was a, we're in the middle of this. Uh, um, I'll give you some images. These are, these are, this is what was going on in Chile, okay? Uh, really, really big protest. Look at that, uh, okay? And uh, just to give you a sense of, of how important this is, these are the photographs of four student leaders. Uh, as you can see, we have very cool student leaders, okay? Uh, <laughs> Some of you who have seen the press may recognize Camila Vallejo, who's in the corner up there, and she was, she was a superstar, okay? And the four of them were elected to Congress this year. So these protests were in 2011. They finished their degrees last year, and now they're Congress people, okay? And so this is, this is, just to give you a sense of how important these, these, these things were, this changed the political landscape in Chile dramatically, okay? Uh, very important things happened. And of course, being in the, having the economics and business school right in the middle of it uh, made the students of our school start pressuring for economic curriculum and made it a big deal, uh, a, big, a big part of it. So the, 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 both the economics and business students were dissatisfied with the curriculum. This generated uh, a big, um, a lot of things. They, they, were, they were dissatisfied with the, 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 the lack of an ethics formation in the curriculum. They were dissatisfied with the way we were teaching human behavior, uh, the lack of other sciences to complement uh, to uh, complement uh, economics. You know, so lack of sociology, lack of psych life psychology. They were dissatisfied with the lack of a formation in social responsibility, in environmental responsibility, and in social entrepreneurship. They were very dissatisfied with a lot. Of, there was a, there was more stuff, but these are the, the the highlights. The economics majors were very, very dissatisfied with how we were treating income distribution. I mean, we measure income distribution all the time in Chile. We're one of the most unequal places in the world, uh, but we have no solution for it. So, I mean, you, you go and study to do that, and your professor tells you, yeah, you can look at a pretty picture about uh, uh, income distribution, but we don't know what to do about it. So, uh, that was very, th there, was a, there was a critical view of how we were teaching collective life in a sense of non-market, non-contractual collectives, how do they, they work. Um, um, there was a critical view of how we were treating politics and power. 
They were very suspicious that inside the method we had, there was an ideological bias, namely that the burden of proof was all, always on one side and not on the other, basically. And there was the same with market failures, which uh, you know, they felt that the, you, you, you had to wait five years to be a graduate to treat market failures seriously, and they felt that, that was ridiculous, and of course it was. What this generated was that academics uh, started admitting their own dissatisfaction with what they teach because of the pressure of the, of the students, and some long-standing academics uh, that have been critical were able to voice their, 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 their views, and this generated the 2012 Comprehensive Curricular Reform. I was brought into office to actually execute this, this reform uh, because I had been a long-standing critic. Um, and just to give you an idea of the reform, and I'm, just, I'm not going to go into each one of these, but I'm just going to mention them, um, and I'll, see, I'll tell you why. We implemented experiments in flipped classroom, which uh, Perry was uh, talking about. We flipped the whole uh, economics uh, curriculum to, uh, in, in a way that now so market failures, we don't talk of them as failures anymore. They're normalities. We have to stop talking about market failures. They're market normalities. It's the usual. It's a normal thing. Moreover, it's your job. If you're an economist or somebody in business, you have a job because there are market failures. Okay? Otherwise, we wouldn't need you. Uh, so this is what we have to study. And market perfection, the Valrasian paradigm, is really an exceptional case which sometimes may becomes true. Okay? So this is the discourse. It's, it's really hard to do this, but we did it. Um, we have compulsory social internships. We have social entrepreneurship uh, program. We change the We have a com communications program which teaches the students to do content, critical content analysis. We change the math focus uh, from calculus to, to statistics, from exercises to problem solving. We increase private internships. We increase the humanities, and we have a new ethics program. I'm not going to go into it, but I can argue why each of these things are really important for a new curriculum in economics or business. Uh, but, but my main message is this, econ curricular reform is not only about econ courses, and we would be very clumsy if we thought so. Uh, it's about a comprehensive look at the curriculum, uh, complete curriculum, because, um, um, well, everything, you know, fits together in some way. But what about the teaching of actual economics, of actual economics courses? What, what, what specific problem did we find there? Well, uh, the professors are the problem, we found. Professors are the problem. And why are professors the problem? Well, there's uh, some of them think that there's nothing wrong with the old Valrasian uh, paradigm. And that's, uh, we know this. And this is, uh, this is an ongoing sort of discussion we, we're having. Uh, but others ignore advances made in economics in the last three decades. OK? So you know, um, let's say the Greenwald-Stiglitz theorem that proves that the two uh, welfare theorems are false, basically, or don't really apply has been around for a long time, okay? And we don't teach it at undergraduate level. We teach the two welfare theorems. So, uh, so it's not like you know, you, there's this new stuff that we have to wait for. It's been around for many, many decades. Uh, Stiglitz has been around. He's, <laughs> he's around here, but he's been around for a long time. And we don't teach him. And, uh, so, and some people just ignore that fact and say, you know, we have to go, you know, we have to dismiss economics. Uh, and uh, well, I, I think that there's a limit to that argument. Um, the solution, of course, is a mix. Uh, we have to update teaching advances uh, in economics. Uh, we also have to embrace radical new thinking and research. We have to do both things. And I think in a, a, a corner solution is not really the answer. Uh, but this has a problem. Um, this is hard work, OK? And one thing that you'll find when you, I mean, those of you who have been uh, heads of uh, schools at universities, like me, uh, you'll find that uh, they don't like hard work. Uh, professors don't like hard work, OK? And why don't they like hard work? Um, first, because there's an academic political economy that's going against anybody who wants to reform anything. Um, at teaching-oriented universities, uh, uh, professors have no time to do innovation, OK? They're doing six up to eight courses in some places. They have no time. They, they want the, the, the teaching uh, book that's already digested, the PowerPoint presentations they can download, everything, you know, ready for them, OK? And that's a reality. We have to, we have to face that reality. Uh, and uh, and uh, not seeing these people is like, uh, is like when the Democrats in, in the US uh, ignored uh, Southern talk radio, OK? And then found out that half the country believes in, uh, in uh, creationism, OK? You can convince people in the elite of something. But you have to also work about the, the masses of people who are using this material. So a lot of teaching-oriented universities, universities have academics that have no time. At research-oriented universities, they have no incentives. They have to do papers. They have to write papers. They have no time for undergraduate teaching. 
Um, so that's a problem. M mine is a research-oriented university, and it's very hard for me to get the, 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 the professors to, to, to do innovation. It's very, very hard. Um, so that's the importance of, 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 the, of the core econ project. Wendy's going to talk more about it, which is about, you know, prefabricating the materials for them, making it easy for them, you know, making it easy for them to get the materials and be able to teach it, to not have to invest so much time in it, and that's very important. Okay, so, and by the way, um, we're going to need to translate this thing. I've, I've, I've seen, and I've, I'm, I'm a big fan of INET, and I'm, I'm probably one of the guys that have seen all the videos, really, I have, uh, and I've pushed them into my students, uh, but you know, some of them are just learning English, and this happens in many countries. If you want to get into the mass market of things, undergraduate level, uh, it's in the local languages. And uh, I think INET has to do a better job with that. You have to have subtitles and stuff, okay? A good model is a, a, a website called uh, Project Syndicate, which we all look at, okay? They translate into many languages. They have a big impact. And we're gonna have to translate the core econ if we wanna have the impact we, we, we want. Uh, the other thing why it's, it's hard to do this is because Teaching has to have a narrative. Um, so if you remember, I argued as a, a while ago that we needed to combin combine updated teaching advances in economics and embrace radical new thinking and research. And to do this combination, to do this tension, to manage this tension, you need a teacher that builds a narrative, tells you why you have this combination or what particular combination you're going to manage. Why is it important to do it this way? And why you have to tolerate little things here and there? And um, so you, you, you have to answer questions like, why are we studying this? Why are we studying it this way? Uh, how is this related to the structure of meaning that sustained me as a student, a scholar, or a citizen? What's allowed and what's not allowed? You know, how is this relevant? How is it related to local issues and problems? Okay, and by the way, this is what professors are for. Otherwise, we would just need you know, online uh, courses or just books. Having a professor in front of you with his subjectivity, this is what it's for. It's for the narrative, right? Uh, it's for, it, it, that's what you're getting. Uh, and you're, we're not gonna get out of that. And um, so the message, if you do this properly, is, and we've had some experiences in, in this, these courses that we flipped this idea of market normalities and market uh, uh, failures is, if you do it properly, you actually get the students who come into the class very critical, they're very skeptical, they always feel that the professor is trying to cheat them out of some radical new ideas, okay? And then they find out that actually economics is interesting, it's useful and fun, uh, that they form part of an interesting debate, that even, even what we call mainstream economics hasn't, uh, hasn't have re resolved debates. There have been things around for 30 years and 40 years that are very useful and been ignored, and there are many open questions that they can, uh, they can uh, participate in solving. And the message is that doing this combination is actually an intellectual and emotional challenge which is worth taking. It's really hard and it's nice and it's interesting. It's a good thing to do, to get yourself to be a, an economics academic or a teacher and get into this mess, okay? So changing, just to uh, ending, so changing the economics and business curriculum requires first of all a comprehensive reform, okay? So how, we have to do what we do in econ, econ courses but also the rest of the curriculum, and that's important to understand. Second, uh, we have to change economic courses, and we have to recognize this sort of production function I see. You, there's the producing of new research and new economic thinking, and, uh, and also reviving and updating the neglected economic thinking. I think we have to, you know, it's always the new things are attractive, but there's these old things that have been there for quite a while, very, very important stuff, and it's been neglected, and sometimes for ideological reasons, okay? And then we have to do, this is the hard part, simplifying and making accessible for responsible undergraduate teaching because this, here's the thing, some of the new stuff is really hard. I mean, Valrasian style economics, supply and demand is really simple, okay? The reason people don't teach Stiglitz at an, at an undergraduate level is because you can do a Edgeworth box and explain the two, the two, the two, uh, the two welfare uh, uh, theorems very easily. It's really hard to explain Greenwell and Stiglitz in an easy undergraduate way. So this job has to be done. And neoclassical economics did this job really well, really well, okay? And uh, that's, that's important. And then, uh, finally, we have to create a community of narrators, of narrators, of teachers, of new economics. They have to construct these narratives, uh, these complicated narratives while you tolerate these, uh, these tensions. And uh, of course, the INET 
is, is involved uh, funding a lot of the, the, the things up there, and that's very, very important, and I hope they do more of it, and it's a it's really important uh, thing. Uh, for example, core econ, some of the things that Perry talked about are, are, are involved in simplifying and making accessible stuff. Uh, this, is very, this is very hard work, by the way. It's very hard work, and, and it has to be supported. And the other thing is, uh, so what are we doing about the, the, the community of narrators? Um, what are we doing there? Um, this is, uh, so some of the things you mentioned sounded like this, and, but I think that uh, maybe we need something like this, you know, teachers for new economic thinking, something like this. We need meetings where people talk about how they teach stuff to an undergraduate, to a second year undergraduate. How do you teach that? In a business school, okay? A non-research oriented business school, which is the majority of people. Uh, otherwise, we're not gonna penetrate the, the mainstream, by the way. And, uh, so I think that, you know, maybe INET could do this. And uh, that's it. Thank you.